Hey guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I'd love to say that it's Sunday night, but it's not. It's actually Wednesday night. So we got a special edition of the workshop podcast. And tonight is January 26, 20. Ha, my daughter caught me the other night. I almost said 2021 again. It's 2022. Whatever's wrong with me, I'm not sure. But <laughs> episode 61 of the workshop podcast. Now tonight, we're going to talk about making money, uh, making an income through rental properties. And we got a special guest. I'm going to bring him on in a minute. I just got a couple of announcements to get out of the way. Um, so what do we, tomorrow night, live on Prepper Broadcast Network, and of course on my YouTube and Float, we are going to have the next edition of Repairedness, where we're going to talk about, uh, actually we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about winter emergencies and preparing for winter emergencies. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, if you haven't yet, we launched the official workshop telegram channel. So it's the place or sorry, chat. We also have a channel as well, but the chats where everybody from the workshop community can get together and we can have a chat. It'll be the official place where we can all meet as a community and have a nice little talk. So I'm looking forward to it. It's just starting to grow. So help me kick it off and get it up off the ground. And, um, <laughs> number three, I should have mentioned this. I was going to say, so our guest tonight was supposed to be Nicole Sauce, as you guys know, and uh, she's a little bit under the weather. So she was nice enough to get me a replacement, but I was going to, she never asked me to do this, but I was going to tell you, I was drinking her hollow roast coffee tonight. Um, it's actually my last pot of her Ethiopian dark roast. So I got to get her to send me up some more because she's absolutely spoiled coffee for me. Um, now I can't drink my regular Maxwell house. So that kind of sucks. But one more quick thing I was going to mention. Uh, so today marks the two-year anniversary. I love to, to attribute milestones and look back on things, but it's a two-year anniversary today of when I was first on Nicole's podcast and when I officially launched my YouTube channel. So, you know, things go a long ways. We build some pretty cool things in a couple of years, but it's always good to look back on milestone moments and just say, hey, very cool, you know? So anyway, all right, without further ado, I'm going to bring on uh, Chris Spees. He is um, from the LFTN community. Hey, Chris, how are you, bud? Good, how are you? Very good. I I know I've told you already once, but you do not know how much I appreciate you coming in. Like Chris is an absolute trooper. He come in on about three and a half minutes notice. Well, not quite, but <laughs> a less than two hours notice, I think. And uh, he's also a bit of an expert on... Uh, income properties and that sort of thing. So tell us who you are, Chris. Okay. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, yes, I've, I guess I'm part of the LFTN community. Um, I've known Nicole and the other folks in that group several years now. Um, I, I live in South Carolina and, and, um, like you said, I do have some income properties that I do as, as a, as a side business. Um, in, in my day job, I work in a, in a, for an industrial company doing marketing work mm -hmm. for, for product marketing. And so, um, yeah, I've, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. No problem. And how long have you been, uh, kind of, uh, like associated with the LFTN community? Mm, at least a couple of years now. Yeah. I've, I've gone to several of their, um, the spring workshop they have and other events throughout the year. Um, other events where maybe people are getting together to do a certain project. So just things like that. Yeah. For several years now. Gone to any of those, um, infamous GSD weekends at all have you or have, yeah, there was, um, probably the latest one I did was, was last year. We had a, a friend that was installing, a um, solar panels and, and a complete, uh, system for his house to, to run on, on solar. So that was pretty cool. What, Sean Mills help with that at all, or was that? Sean did, yeah. Sean yeah. was kind of leading the effort there. So we installed uh, three real big solar panels, and then uh, there was a whole setup inside of battery storage and battery management and, and all of that. So it was pretty, pretty neat. I'm kind of jealous. I'm going to finally, my, my wife is like, I, I always joke with her, but I'm like, I'm going to finally get to meet all my imaginary internet friends in real life when we come down to the uh, right. workshop, right? So That's right. We'll, we'll see you there for that. That'll be fun. I've been talking to Nicole, Nicole and uh, Patrick a bit and a bunch of other people on Zello for, mm -hmm. oh, it's got to be the better part of five years now, I think pretty close. Oh, wow. And I've never, I mean, it's a bit of a jump from, you know, the frozen wasteland that is uh, the People's Republic of Canada to come down mm -hmm. to visit you guys, you know? So mm -hmm. 
but oh, we're wow. doing it. Last year we had, we were actually supposed to come last spring. And of course, you know, everything and blah, blah, blah. And we had to cancel, but this year, oh no, no, we're going. So <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. So you're going to probably fly down or are you going to? Yeah, fly? we're going to, we're going to make a vacation out of it. We are uh, taking two weeks. We're going to fly in about 10 days before, maybe nine days before. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to go over, we've already got it kind of booked out, but what is the spring break area in is it North or South Carolina? What's the beach there? Or yeah, like Myrtle Beach, Charleston. Yeah, we're gonna go over there for a night and then down to oh, northern Florida. We've got it all booked out. We're gonna go to Orlando for a couple of days, then okay. over to New Orleans and then back up to Nashville for well, oh, I guess. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be I like to drive. So this is the best of both worlds. We can fly down, then rent a car and drive around. It'll be fun. So yeah, that you'll get to see a lot if you can do that. Like you said, northern Florida and then New Orleans and then up. Wow, that'll be great. Oh yeah, we we're gonna we try to. I, I don't know if as a Canadian you try to do all the different states, you know. So yeah. we're, you know, we've we've hit a lot of the the west coast and the Midwest and and the um, the east coast, like the the north northeast north. Yeah, but I've never. My wife has been down Florida way, but I we I've never been down there. So mm -hmm. it'll be fun. You know, you should have really pretty nice weather too. Really, that time of year. Oh, I'm yeah, and you know, uh, a couple of years ago, we well, four or five years ago, we went to San Diego, and we left San Diego, and it was like 30 degrees Celsius, which was you know I can't I have fair. It's a good it's a good temperature, right? Okay. And uh, by the time I got back to Alberta, this was the middle of April, and it was minus 20. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that doesn't normally happen. That is out, out of the ordinary, but mm -hmm. it still sucked really bad. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, I'm. Um, you said what you do for a day job. So how many how many rentals do you have? How long you've been doing it? That kind of stuff. Uh, I have t have two right now. Um, okay. I've been doing it for oh, probably close to ten years total. But um, yeah, the 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 market now is a little bit crazy. Trying to you know add rentals. It's actually you know a good time to sell if you can because. It's just um, the market's just going crazy, but yeah, probably about 10 years total. Okay. Uh, and how did you get into Like what, what, made um, you, what kind of inspired you to, yeah, you know? Yeah. So um, my parents, when I lived in Ohio, they, they had rental property and they were both um, real estate agents at one time. And so um, I was always, when I was, very young always helping my dad if he you know if there was a renter that moved out and he had to you know rehab the place to get it ready to rent again i would always help him with that you know whether you know it was some mundane task of taking out trash or cleaning a carpet or whatever it is replacing a water heater whatever it might be i was um i would help him with that so um that that kind of got me started and just you know talking to him about um the fact that you know, you can get some passive income from, from doing rentals, you know, so you either have to take, you know, either spend time or money usually mm -hmm. to make more money. And in this case, um, you know, if you can create a passive income stream, it, it makes it kind of nice because you can still do your day job and do that on the side if you want. So. Uh, no, your Joe just wondered where you're located. I forgot to ask you that way we talking before. So yeah, I'm in South Carolina right on yeah yeah and nice and warm there today or no no not really we're in uh let me see here it's well it says it's 40 degrees right now but um we've we've been in uh the 20s to low 30s Ooh. at night yeah. and the 40s to maybe about 50 during the day so it's not too bad so your your dad was pretty handy was he he was or is uh, or i don't know yeah, well yeah i mean there there are things like um you know, major electrical or major plumbing that he would not do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, your general cleanup, repainting, you know, installing a new sink, things like that, you know, fixing certain things, you know, because renters can be pretty hard on stuff. So like screen doors that are loose or yep. cabinets that are the hinges are pulling out or whatever it might be, um, you know, door hinges, same thing. So there's a lot of things that I've learned from him that that I'll, that I'll do today, you know, to, uh, when I'm going to fix something. So what well, you said about, um, extensive electrical and stuff like that. I always, I was always told years ago, they said, if you give somebody bad, 
plumbing advice, they'll only end up with wet feet. But if you give somebody bad electrical advice, well, you know where they can end up, right? So, right, right, yeah, exactly. I get that. Yeah. So what do you, you do a lot of, a lot of your own repairs and fixes and stuff? Um, I do. I, I had one that I just fixed up recently and basically the whole place needed painted, okay. uh, needed, needed new carpets. Um, I had a sink that needed repaired and you know, just things like the bathtub, tub, shower need to be cleaned and recocked and stuff to make it nice. Uh, you know, replace light bulbs, broken, broken window screens, and things like that. So, um, how long were the tenants in there before they moved out? They were, they were there about, I want to say about four years. That's so, not bad then. Really, that's not too bad. I mean, you. You know, I've always debated like when you come to that point where they move out, the carpet is in bad shape. Do you replace the carpet? Do you, you know, maybe replace it with hardwood floors or or luxury vinyl or whatever? And, and and maybe you have some ideas on that too. Now, just from a durability standpoint, which one or what you like to do? You know, because it's going to be costly either way. And mm -hmm. you know, carpet only lasts so long, no matter how good they take care of it. So. And oh, and even the best tenants, I, and, well, it doesn't, I shouldn't say the best tenants, the best, anybody with the best intentions in the world, you end up with troubles with carpet. No, you know, I mean, especially with animals. Oh my God. I've had some bad ones with animals, but I don't, I, I like, I like heavy duty vinyl myself, but I, yeah. I don't, um, I'm, I can install vinyl flooring. You know, I would do it in my own home if I had to, if it was like a square room or, you know, I wouldn't want to do it in like something where you had to cut out around an Island and everything. But yeah, I really like heavy duty vinyl. I just long-term in rentals, it seems to hold up. It's either that or hardwood. Cause at least hardwood you can refinish, but vinyl tends to be a little cheaper, I think, but. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've installed hardwood before, but only in my own home, but I, I, scene where you know people would do things that you never think of like i had a <laughs> um tenants that were uh lifting weights in an, in a room that had you know the traditional three quarter inch hardwood oh and they were doing you know like barbells and then just basically dropping them so it's it's like you had these huge dents and scratches in the wood and it's like what you know it's really hard to even sand that out and redo it you know so i oh yeah we we had one I went up, I got a call from a, a lady uh, out of town. She's like, would you come up and take care of it? I'm like, sure. And they had taken and boxed off this entire room that they were growing drugs in and just had completely destroyed it. Like carpet, ceiling, it didn't matter. It was just a mess, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, know Your Joe just said, uh, how are property values in South Carolina? Has there been any major shifts in the values? Yeah. <laughs> you can talk about that. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, it's like, my, like everywhere. Places, I mean, things have things have gone crazy. I would say, you know, especially on the lower at, you know, maybe the high end properties, you know, two and 300 and $400,000 properties, maybe haven't moved that much, but on the lower end, like 150,000 or less, those have gone up 20, 30% in the last couple of oh. years. They've gone up a lot. And so, um, and the other thing is because the demand is so high, if you want to buy a place, normal you know especially if it's on the lower end normally they want they want a cash offer they don't want any contingencies you know it's just very much a seller's market it's tough i never thought of that so they they literally they basically want you to well like basically pay pay cash up front and and take it without any inspections that kind of stuff yeah i mean there are some that will you know let you inspect it but don't don't plan on them fixing anything. Like if you do an inspection and find this or that or the other, you know, a lot of times there's a clause where you can just basically walk away if it's really bad. But yeah, you know, it used to be that was like a, a leverage thing where, you know, if you had an inspection done or certain things that need to be done, you could ask them to do that as part of the as part of the deal. And now it's it's like, well, do you want it or not? So right. it, take it or leave it, you know? Yeah. In, in my hometown, well, where I grew up on the East Coast of Nova Scotia, um, you know, you, my entire life, adult life, child life, you know, you, if you spend a hundred thousand dollars on a home, you, you could basically buy a mansion there, you know, like, I mean, stuff was cheap. 
and property in the country. And I mean, when I say the middle of nowhere, I don't mean like the cute, quaint middle of nowhere. I mean like yeah. the worst, you know, you could buy house land with many acres for, you know, 30 or $40,000, you know? And I thought somebody had posted this as a joke. This is a few months back. And it was a house that there's no way it would ever be renovated. I mean, you could see daylight through the ceiling. There was trees growing up through it. And it was on like a half an acre of land. And I know this road. Like, I mean, there's, it's just, there's no redeeming qualities of there at all. Half an acre and they wanted $70,000 for it. Wow. And I, I almost, I almost, I could, I thought it was a joke and no, no, they, and they even, the, the realtor even took the time to write one of those cushy write-ups, you know, how realtors make everything look charming and quaint, and, you know? Oh, yeah. And I was like, just put it up there. Be like, listen, the market's uh, hot. We're selling this. That's not worth it for what it is. Take it or leave it, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Would that be a property that you'd buy and just tear down the house or what is, is it actually fixable? I, boy, I don't know. I, personally would never want to tackle it. I think it's beyond, I think the, the main reason they were selling it with the structure still on it was because there's some grandfathering allowed there. You know, um, you probably wouldn't need to have a septic inspection. Um, electrical might technically not be as expensive to get hooked up because there's a property there, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. It just, it was astronomical. Like that property 10 years ago when we moved out here would have sold for 10 or $15,000, Yeah, you know? So, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's the same. I think it's pretty much like that in the U S right now, where if you go on to, um, gosh, who has those good charts? I don't remember if it's Zillow or maybe it's, is it truly, I don't know if you have the same ones up there, but like it'll show, uh, over time, the value of the home. And it's, it's like, <laughs> it'll be bumping along at, you know, say it's hundred grand. It'll be bumping along at that, that rate for like the past eight years. And then the last two years, you show the thing going up like an amusement park ride. I mean, it, it's, it would, it, you know, it'd be like say 90,000 and, um, you know, over two years, they would have it listed for like 140 or something. There's you gotta know, be a correction coming. Don't you think? There oh, has yeah. To be. Yeah. There is. I, I'm not sure how how these homes are appraising for what they do. If people need to get a loan or whatever, that that's where I think. And I'm sure the local government will be able to, you know, pull in some more tax dollars that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. At least in the short term. But yeah, um, Martinson family said the worst issue they ever had was uh, renting. They got a call several years ago on Christmas Eve that the house was burning down. So. That's horrible. If you want to elaborate on that, Martinson family, in the comments, go ahead. Um, and know your Joe. We got all kinds of questions. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you another one here. And um, it says, how much do you set aside for future repairs and revisions? That's a great question. That is. How a good do you one. do that? Yeah. Um, you know, when when you're, I would say when you're first starting out and you're getting a house ready to rent, I would make it as perfect as I could from a mechanical standpoint not you know maybe not appearance but of course have it painted and everything but if there's anything that's sketchy at all like leaking plumbing or electrical work or whatever get all that done because ha trying to do that after the fact when people are in there is just so expensive because um you know they're living there so you have to get it done you have to get it done mm -hmm. quickly and sometimes that might be on a sunday or whatever so um as far as setting aside money you probably want to have i don't know it would vary maybe you know at least some money maybe 500 dollars, maybe more i i had one where i had to replace the um the hvac hvac system and it was about five thousand dollars and it's not like you can say hey can can you hold up on that for a few weeks so i save enough money up to mm -hmm. you know so you got to be ready for that um I, I don't know if you have a recommendation on that based on what you've seen, but. Oh man, like it's tough. Like uh, we, you know what on work, uh, first off, you're absolutely right. Get things done for the tenants move in there. I hate working around people in general and it always takes three times as long and you have to be three times as careful and nothing ever seems to, I don't know when, when the house is empty and you're working, it always seems like parts are there. You can always get parts, but when, when you need it done 
for somebody living in a place. It's like, oh, it's going to be three weeks for that widget that you need for the furnace. And uh, there's nothing you can do about it, right? And mm -hmm. On multiple occasions, I've had the landlords put the tenants up in hotels for a couple of nights just to get them out of there. If it's really, you know, we had to fix a sewer line one time, cut down through the floor. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It It's tough. Like, yeah, and you can't always do it. You know, sometimes you just got to go in and fix it while they're there. But um, mm -hmm. do, you have, I, did, um, do you have a percentage? Like, do you, how much out of each month's rent would you say you would use for upkeep and expenses and stuff like that? I try to do, you know, roughly maybe 10% of mm -hmm. what I'm getting through proceeds, you know, to, to save. So you should always plan on something going on every month. So, you know, it might only be, you know, $50 or $100 or something, but you should try to save something towards that because there's all kinds of things that come up, plumbing stuff. I had once where um, we had a lot of rain and there was a big tree in the front yard that started leaning after that. Wasn't going to fall in the house, but they were kind of concerned. And so, and it was tall and it was near power lines, you know, so it was like $800 to remove that tree. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't anything you were planning on doing, but you have to have, you have to kind of be ready for some of that stuff. So. Do you ever find, I, I had um, actually the bigger, the biggest landlord I work for, he said, you almost always have the most issues when they're newly moved in. Like in that first month, the two months, they seem to always find the little, and I understand and I'm not being complaining. It just seems you almost have to plan on a little extra money or a little extra work when people first move in, you know? Yeah, I think that's good. And there, there's always the, um, you know, conflict between, you know, is there really an issue there or, you know, what, but in most cases, I would rather have them tell me, Hey, there's, it, it's wet under the kitchen sink. You know, there's something going on. Then to just say, huh, you know, and leave it. And then all that gets all messed up over time with water damage, you know? So there, there's plus and minuses of them telling you. And normally I think you're right. They would, they would find that when they first move in. So you ever, I, I get that too. Like, oh, wow. I thought there was a bit of a leak under the sink and you go in there and you can tell it's been leaking for like six months and it's full of mildew and the wood is rotten and it stinks. And then all of a sudden you've got an issue, <laughs> you know? And oh, yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. I would much prefer having someone call and be like, hey, you know, just an issue. Just want to let you know. I'd rather keep in contact. You know, sometimes you get nervous. You're like, oh, they're a model tenant. I haven't heard from them in a year. But then sometimes you're like, I wonder, you know, <laughs> it just gets you nervous. Right. The, the other problem is, and I'm sure you've seen this, where the tenants will take on the job it's themselves. It, you know, something simple like, say they damage the wall from hanging pictures or, you know, uh, so something pulls out of the wall and instead of doing it right with spackle and whatever, they'll use like tape or something, you know? And so, <laughs> yeah, that's what happened with the last one. And so when I went in the paint, this person was like really good at using clear packing tape on every little hole and you pull that tape because you're not going to paint over that, right? No. You pull that tape it off and it just makes more of a mess. It's like, you just left it i'm okay with you know fixing little things so. so there's a question here maybe you can i don't quite understand it and i might just be thick so if somebody needs this is do you charge per square foot or general market value in that in that a three two two goes for a boat does that make sense or is that uh oh if, if i'm if i'm determining what the rent's going to be I think that must be what he means. Yeah. yeah Sorry. And, and Joe, go ahead and uh, know your Joe if you want to clarify too. But yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't really do square footage as much. I mean, the, the main thing that I find is, is um, uh, how many, how many bedrooms it has and how many bathrooms it has. You know, if it's, if it's 1200 square feet or 1500, you might get a little bit more, but it's, it's really going to be based on, the area that it's located. So, um, you know, a lot of times you can uh, you do simple things. Like if you drive by it and look at the place, uh, drive around that area and see what the rest of the area looks like. Maybe there's some for rent signs and other yards and call them and ask them what they're charging. That's you a know, good idea. Uh, sure. Yeah, it'll give you an idea. Um, so not, not so much square foot, but, but I would, I would say the features like he has, 
uh, down here. She has down here, you know, the yep. number of bedrooms, number of baths. Uh, if it has okay. a garage, you know, that type of thing. Um, and yeah, yeah, this, we've had more questions tonight. This is great. Thank you guys. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, said without checking the land, I think that might be uh, landlord acts. Can you not do a quarterly home inspection to check these things? I think he was talking about where I was worried about a place for a year, but I don't know. What do you think? Like I I've always been to the, I don't know. I like to give tenants their privacy if I can. And if things seem to be going smooth, I, I do the old slow drive by once in a while. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you like? How often um, do you do inspections, or do you? Or I, I don't normally. Um, I I I use a, a um, rental management company now, and okay. they'll they'll they may try to do something once a year. You know, if you have other things like um, uh, say like a termite inspection or things like that, you know, the person they might send out they'll like look around and give them basic feedback. Like, Hey, I think maybe this needs to be done or, you know, this la railing is loose or whatever it might be. But generally, no, leave them alone because they're most of the tenants, they're going to tell you if, if something is wrong, I think, but um, it's not a, it's not a bad idea. I don't know if I don't normally do it on a regular basis. So maybe, maybe you do. I'm not sure. I, we, we, I don't know, I guess, from and I, I for for the people who aren't sure, like I just do property management. I don't own any rentals yet, but it, we do a lot of that for them. But um, I find in this, you know, the tenants that pay their rent tend to not be the tenants that do all the damage, and it usually is the first sign. They normally get on the radar when they're behind in their rent, and then all of a sudden you're like, if that's the first step, then you're kind of wondering, okay, how, how are things going? Maybe I need to keep a closer eye on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I take a, I take a run by all my properties, at least on a weekly basis that I look after anyway, just kind of, you know, nothing's burnt down. It doesn't seem to be a meth lab, you know, in there or anything like that. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but it is good. You know, it's nice to, I have, you know, to me, it seems like uh, it's nice to give them their space too, because everybody likes to have a quiet place to live and if they're paying the rent usually seems okay. Hey. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think um, that, then that that's good. Uh, oh, Dylan's here from Steady Presence. Hey, Dylan. And uh, Know Your Joe says, do you qualify future potential rentals? Background check via association word of mouth or dot, dot, dot. Yeah, that's a good question. What do you, how do you do that? Or what do you do there, Chris? Um, again, right now, going through a property manager, that's one of the nice things that they'll do is all the upfront screening. Um, so that, I usually rely on them to, to do that as far as background checks. Yeah. So talk about the property management companies you do, like, um, you know, have you had to switch between, are you happy with them? What do they cost percentage wise, that kind of stuff? Yeah. I've only worked with two different ones. One I had to, um, I'll say basically fire because I, I didn't like the way they were handling things. I, I had, um, some issues where they would either uh, not talk to me before fixing something or oh. they, they were slow getting back to the renters. And I'm like, oh, I can't have that. You know, it, it, the renters need a good place to live. But as far as um, cost, your mileage may vary, but in, in where, where I, where I am, it's normally, a, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15% of the gross rent is what they would charge for uh, management fees every month to take care of it. So, but they would do, like you're saying, all the screening, um, they would they would handle um, the repairs as far as who, who to call. And normally, um, if, if you work with a good rental management agency, they have a whole crew of folks that they use on a regular basis. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can get things done really quickly. Like the one that I'm working with now, they have a company that it's just excellent. They do uh, electrical plumbing and, and HVAC. So what's nice about oh, that wow. is if they go out for like an HVAC call, you know, they might say, Hey, also, can you look at the, one of the outlets in one of the bedrooms it doesn't seem to be working and boom, they'll just, take care of that while they're out there. So you don't get all these separate fees having somebody come out to do things, which is really nice. I got to remember that because yeah, that's basically just the one service call and then just your labor costs beyond that, that, that could add up over the years. Oh, 
Totally. Yep. Because what we run into here quite often, we have, you guys have natural gas where you live? Or we do. We okay. do. Because yeah. it's every house here has it. And a lot of times the guy that does the natural gas isn't the guy that does the electrical or isn't the guy that does the plumbing. So you usually you got to end up having a couple of guys in for that kind of stuff, you know, and, and that gets expensive. Every time you got to call, call a guy, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, that's another $150 flat rate service call plus, right? And, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but you've been pretty happy with them so far. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. So how do you, how long has it been since you bought a property? Uh, probably about three, three years now, maybe a little bit more. And it's just because the market is so crazy. I mean, it's, it's just such a seller's market right now. It's, it's hard to justify the, the cost of the properties and actually you know, make a cash flow on them because they're just so, so expensive right now. So maybe take, take us back, say, let, let, let's pretend like the market isn't crazy like it is, but <laughs> let's go back 36 months when you bought your last one. How did you decide what to buy, where to buy it, that kind of stuff? Okay. Um, yeah, the last one was, was probably within five miles of where I live. And I, and I happened to come across one that had been uh on the market for gosh probably six months at a time and it was actually a foreclosure so bank foreclosure Ooh. so that, that makes it a little bit better now you don't have that as much anymore you know it's it's it nowadays you'll see even if it's a foreclosure they'll say give us your highest and best offer <laughs> yep next five days or whatever and that's it you know it's like and whoever can offer cash and no contingencies are going to get it but but back then it was different so um because it was a foreclosure, of course, it's usually usually a little bit a little bit less money, and um, yeah, that was the last that was the last one I did. So, um, so close to you, that's kind of important. So you're not miles miles away. Yeah, I, I it is it is. I I've considered you know looking at properties up to maybe about two hours two hours away. If I can find a good property manager, I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, okay. it's just, I haven't found anything, uh, lately that would, that would, that would suit that. So, um, so what do you find? Like, what's the best, I don't know, cost to rent ratio, like three bed, two bath, two bedroom, one bath. Like, what do you, what do you look for in, in a rental? Mm, like that? Well, way? that's a really good one. I, it, and this is something my dad always tried to do is, is always try to find something with three bedrooms. So okay, I only rent single family homes. Um, so I don't do duplexes and things like that. Not that I, not that I want, I just have it. But I think if you can find something that's three bedroom, one bath or three bedroom, two bath, I think that's good. Um, you know, they're, they're depending, you know, if it's, if it's in a good location, maybe closer to a downtown or something. It's only two bedroom, one bath that that works too. But I, I find that three bedrooms is kind of like your sweet spot. You know, yeah. Is, is, is where you'd want to start. Okay. Um, I'm guessing people, nobody complains about having an extra bedroom, you know, they can mm -hmm. turn it into a, you know, a, a little gym or a home sewing room or something, or if they have a baby, but it's a lot harder to deal with something that's two bedrooms when you need three, I suppose. Right. Yeah. I think so too. So um, that, that, that's kind of where I start. Yeah. No, your Joe says, have you ever considered commercial real estate at all? I haven't. No, I, you know, you kind of stick with what you know and mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure there's money to be, to be made with that, but, but I haven't. Um, I'm not sure where the commercial real estate market is now, especially for office space and stuff. You know, with a lot of people work from home, it might be, maybe it's different in Canada. I don't know, but yeah. I think it's a, it's funny. I, I never really thought about it till you mentioned it, but it is commercial real estate right now is like the complete opposite of residential real estate. Like it's completely bottomed out and flatlined and, and we, we've had a, a one, two punch up here in Alberta. I mean, we've been five years now dealing with the downturn of the oil when the oil crashed there about five years ago. So we already seen a huge outflux. Is that the right term? Outflux? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> we've seen a, a, a huge um, leaving of the city. Like Calgary was like at 100, I want to say it was like 
office space capacity at one time, you know, with all the big, mm -hmm. and then, then it was down to, I, I don't, I can't remember the numbers. I, you know, I'd be pulling them out of my head if I, you know, but it was down really bad before COVID and now it's, yeah. So it, it's tough. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I got, yeah, you're probably right though. You do, you do what you, you know, right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so Becky and I, that's my wife. We, we actually, uh, part of the reason that I was, I uh, wanted to have somebody on to talk about this is because uh, selfish reasons, of course, but we're, we're looking at purchasing our first couple of rentals. We, um, we have a bit of a thing there. So what kind of tips do you have for, you know, new, new landlords or potential new landlords or that kind of stuff? Like, what do you, where do you start? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I would say, you know, understand, you know, your goals as far as are you looking for cash flow? Are you looking for maybe a slight amount of cash flow with appreciation over time? Hmm. You know, usually sometimes those go together, but um, normally, you know, if you, if you grade a property like an A property, a B or a C property, you know, uh, your C properties are probably going to cash flow better, but you're going to probably have more turnover and you know that type of thing where something like say an a property uh you may barely cash flow but you're looking at it appreciating over time and maybe selling it within five years or ten years you know all, all depends on what kind of what you're looking for so i would say you know start with that um and then you know for me i i like running single family homes so you know, if that's a consideration, you know, look at that. But. So do you, I'm for me being kind of handy, I, I, I kind of like the idea of buying maybe a bit of a dumpy one and fixing it up, you know, a bit. Do you, I, do you have you looked at that or have you done that at all? Oh or? yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love the homes that um, cosmetically look awful. <laughs> yeah. Or not hard to fix. Like for me, uh, a lot of the homes, you know, there are homes that use gas, but a lot of them are electric. So if you have a home and say the HVAC system is pretty good and the roof is good, mm -hmm. then the rest of it really doesn't matter. You know, there could be giant holes in the wall, windows broken, whatever. That's all easy stuff to fix and not expensive either. But if you got to put a new HVAC system in, um, like I said, that might be five, six, seven grand you know, roof, same. So those are the things I look at, you know, the last, the last one I, I had, um, I replaced all the windows in it. And of course, all the flooring and the painting and, and all the drywall stuff, put new kitchen counters in, things like that. Those really aren't too bad as far as cost. It's, it's the main mechanical things. Like if you look at an older home that's built in the sixties, it might have like screw in type fuses or stuff and maybe, you know, 50 amp panel or something. And mm. so even if you, and say it didn't even have air conditioning, even if you wanted to add that, you're going to have to upgrade all the electrical too. And that gets really costly. So those are the things I look at. If you, if you, if you find a home, at least in the U S that's, you know, maybe built in the seventies or eighties, mm -hmm. that can be a lot better than a home that's built in the fifties as far as the electrical and things like that. So, you know, I kind of, I kind of start with that stuff. And then the cosmetic things, like I said, are not, not that, not that difficult to fix. So that's great advice. Yeah. So, you know, good bones. I always, I always said that to Becky, you want a house with good bones, but, yeah. but you know, so H HVAC roof and electrical are your big ones. If, if they're in good shape, like the rest is spit and polish, right? Yeah. <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know it's everything costs, you know, right. but yeah. Yeah. A lot of it. Yeah. It's, it's not as costly or, you know, especially things like painting and things you can do yourself. So you do like, did you do countertops and things yourself too, or I have, um, I'm not great at it, but, but I've, I've learned it over the years. I've only done, uh, I've not done like, um, uh, where you have like a slate countertop or things like that, you know, just, just the kind you can get from like Home Depot where it's already has the miter cuts in the corners and things and mm -hmm. just measure and fit and get it all nice and level and that type of thing. But, um, you know, you kind of learn as you go, like, you know, I've, I had where, um, 
I had a countertop that that went. I had to make a cutout for the sink, which was fun. I had to me I measured it like five or six times. Oh so, no! Right. Yep. And then the countertop went to a corner and then around a the corner and then got to the stove area and stuff. Well, that corner, that miter, um, I was like, well, how do you do this? You know? So I look on YouTube and they're like, well, there's these little bolts underneath that pull it all together. And people say, you know, you can put silicone in the, in the joint and pull it together. Well, I saw one video. They're like, when you pull that together and the silicone starts squeezing out of the joint, don't instinctively just take a paper towel or whatever and wipe that because you'll never get it like completely clean and you'll always leave, you know, the clear silicone on there. They say, just squeeze it together, let it squeeze out and let it just sit there and then come back the next day with a razor and just cut it off and it's perfect. You know, so things like that, that you learn to do make, make a lot of difference, you know, small things like that. Well, I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen that stuff where it's just like, there's a right way to do things, you know, and that's a simple one, but, or, or like, um, I don't know if you've ever used or, or know Tim, uh, if you use a saber saw to cut out the hole for the sink, mm -hmm. they make a blade where the teeth, you know, the saber saw, the teeth are going up mm -hmm. and down. Right? Yep. They make a blade where the teeth are angled downward. So you mark it on the top and you, and you rip down through the, um, the countertop and it doesn't it doesn't splinter the countertop it it pulls it i don't know what you call that but it's a blade it's a real like a reverse blade yeah so and it, it does a really smooth it doesn't matter that's cool yeah and um so uh i can't remember who makes them but yeah those i i love that like so what are your uh what are your favorite repairs to do because i can tell you enjoy it obviously it's neat I, I like when people light up and they get excited i'm like oh he likes doing repairs that's cool so i mean things like that or um you know there's there's all kinds of tricks like we, we talked about you know cabinet doors being loose or or just interior doors coming loose like pulling out of the hinges you're like how does that happen i put a three inch screw in there mm -hmm. and yet they pull it out and so i've talked to People that use everything from like, they'll take like a golf tee, a golfer's tee and mm -hmm. shove it in there and break the head off and then run your screw back in and it tightens everything up. Or I, I think someone on that LFTN um, community said something about using toothpicks, you know. Toothpicks and wood glue, yeah. zip ties. I've yeah. used a dry, drywall anchors are one of the best, you know, the screw in white ones, oh, like the big okay. ones, but they make a hinge anchor that I love. It looks like a cone and okay. you just put it in the hole, tap it in as far as you can. Don't tap it hard because it'll break off. Tap it in until it stops, snap it off hundred percent. It'll fix it every single time. Unless the hole is like, you know, unless once in a blue moon, you'll have one that pulls out. Ted, Ted's in here tonight. He's a handyman down in Florida as well. He says he uses toothpicks and glue, but oh, there you go. these hinge anchors are the best I've come across. They're expensive. They're like, I don't know, six bucks for a four pack or something like that. But I mean, that's peanuts when you figure out, you know, how much hair a person's going to lose trying to fix them yourself when you pull your own hair out. Right. So, oh yeah. Yeah. But there's things like, just like you're saying, um, I had one where I put, um, what's that stuff called? Like the closet made, uh, like M uh, MD or, uh, okay. yeah. Melamine shelving. Right. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yep. And, um, you're thinking, okay, they're going to put jeans and sweaters and stuff up on the shelf and they put something super heavy on it and they rip the whole thing out. And so you're like, okay, well, I can't really put oversized anchors in those same holes because it's really torn out and you, you know, but just plan on that, plan on that kind of stuff happening where you got to figure out, you know, patch all those holes and move everything over, you know, hopefully to the next stud that you can tie it in and and redo it because that's that those kind of things happen so everybody who follows the channel knows i don't really like ikea and i definitely don't like ikea furniture stay away from it for rentals you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah but uh know your joe says uh stay away from older homes with cast iron main sewage lines and older homes with galvanized supply pipes you ever mm -hmm. have you run into any of that at all i i haven't uh my my father had that <coughs> excuse me with the home that had some I guess the cast iron pipes. Um, and I guess the issue was they, they just, 
they rust out over time, right? I mean, I'm not, I don't know if you've dealt with it much, but I, I've dealt with it a lot. But they, the biggest, I mean, they can become brittle, but the biggest thing is that they collect on the interior. So the, the, um, the interior diameter gets smaller and smaller over time. Mm. So once, once rust starts and buildup starts, then of course, you know, it's like a clogged artery in your heart, right? Oh, <laughs> okay. And so then eventually, you know, like my mom and dad's house is, well, the oldest part is almost a hundred years old, but even oh, wow. the, the newer part is from the fifties and they for years have had slow moving sewer and water because their supply pipe from the standpipe out of the road to inside the house is galvanized mm -hmm. and their old sewer line is cast iron. And mm -hmm. it, both of those are notorious for corroding on the inside. So you eventually lose and lose and lose. And they just have never wanted to spend the, yeah, it's only probably 1500 or 2000 or whatever, but to get their front yard dug up, you know, that 20 feet out to the road or 30 feet because anyway you know they they've learned to live with it but they they are gonna i think maybe this year or next finally but cast iron is a miserable bugger because it can just break like we i told you about the one where we had to cut down through the floor in the kitchen and oh, yeah. that that was just a completely unsupported probably 15 foot length of uh three inch cast iron and eventually it just broke in half you know and oh, wow. yeah so it happens but yeah um, and i don't know if there's if there's a certain time frame you know okay in the 60s they did this in the 70s they did this in the 80s they did that but you know i would assume the older the home is the more chance it has of having that type of materials in there for your for your plumbing so and we ran into clay pipe too on one house we, yeah. we bought, oh, oh, oh our, our um second house we ever bought anyway out east was 130 years old and the sewer line was octagon clay pipe in four foot sections. Oh so God. they were all, oh yeah. And it collapsed or shifted. And so we didn't even have a sewer line that would run out anymore. So it was, yeah. yeah. But uh, Chris Dix, and this is great. I forgot about this tip, but he said when we, when we did our house closets, sorry, when we did our host closet walls, they were all covered with good one side half inch plywood. So you can put a hook or shelf anywhere. Oh, wow. That is a great idea. And I, I've heard about. Do you normally do you normally cover that with drywall then, or you just leave it? I don't. Yeah, Chris, what did you you do? Like I've seen it done both ways, but um, something that I, I was listening to a radio show a couple of years back, and they were talking about um, building houses to live in for a lifetime. So the idea was that they were putting reinforced plywood behind drywall in areas that eventually would need grab bars or railings or supporting, mm -hmm. um, you know, lift chairs to go up, you know, so they're basically, you know, building the house for, a, you know, a 25 year old couple to live in until they're 75, you know, so okay. there would be. And so I think I, I'm guessing it's behind the, the drywall, but mm -hmm. Chris will chime in. If not, he'll send me an email tonight to let me know he's good like that. So I appreciate yeah. it. But but either way, that is great. Oh, yeah. That's that. I've not done that, but that's a good idea. And know your Joe says our current home has cast iron main sewage line uh, built in 1978. Want to find someone to remedy this? Oh, okay, yeah, because he asked. Actually, go back a little bit further. I'd seen this. I haven't seen it done, but you can. They have. Have you seen where they reline cast iron pipe with that resin? I've heard of it, but I've not experienced it. No. I haven't either. I think it's cool. I, I haven't, Joe. So I'll, uh, if I can find some information on it, I know there's some pretty cool videos out there on it, but I, yeah, it, it's pretty neat. And I guess cost wise, it's worth not needing to dig up or whatever. But it almost sounds, I mean, I know it's not the same, but it almost sounds like taking an old bathtub and relining it with or recovering it with some kind of ceramic or something. But yeah, and you can do, you can do that with, um, if you ever run into old toilet flanges as well, if you get the old nasty ones that are getting kind of hard to deal with, you can actually get a rubber sleeve flange that fits down inside the old one. It does restrict the flow a little bit, but it gives you all new holes to put screws in and things like that. That's important. That's good. Yeah, it really. So, and I bet if Ted's still in here, I bet he's seen it done before because he's a, he, he knows a lot about the plumbing, but. Okay. And know your Joe says we're in the process of redoing the bathroom at it. Two by six supports in the walls for grab bars. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any concerns? Do you, um, any handicap kind of issues with any of your rentals or anything or no, no. 
no no ramps or anything you don't yeah no no, no. what um, about uh have you had any horror stories at all i know you said you've had pretty good tenants but what's the kind of the i don't know the worst situation you've dealt with um, really really nothing too bad i mean i've had where um you know people say they have one pet small dog it's very nice whatever and then when they when they move out you you find a lot of damage either you know to doors or floors and things like that you know to fix where it's like it's obvious they keep them in a room and the dog will like scratch the door and like you know just totally tear up the wall and the molding and the flooring and everything so you know just just general things like that i mean most of the time people are you know they do the right thing so that's good do you allow pets i do if they got to be under a certain weight and size um i i did have this was a long time ago where rented to folks that had cats supposedly had one cat but you know yeah I, I know. and you know there was finding the litter box issues and things and i had where um you know the cat damaged the hardwood floors and the walls and stuff and that's not easy to i had somebody come in and fix it and they they had to cut out the floor and the subfloor was so bad replace that and then luckily um i had some uh an extra box of hardwood um you know the tiny roof type hardwood and he weaved it back in so it didn't look like he just cut out a square and did an excellent job that's not cheap to do that you know especially if you don't know how to you did great. So I used to sell building supplies and what people would always do is they'd come in to get their laminate or their hardwood floor and they would buy, like I'd, I always tell them buy 10% more than you need because you're going to have waste and stuff. Right. But invariably they'd have one full box left. And at the end of the job, they'd come down proud as punch to the hardware store. And they're like, I'd like to return this please. And I'm like, let me tell you a story. I will gladly give you your money back, but What's not going to happen is in three years when you drop a hot whatever on it and burn a hole through your floor and you come back to me and say, hey, do you have any of that flooring? I'm going to tell you it's discontinued. You're never going to find it again. So take that box home for the $50 it's going to cost you, put it up overhead in the garage and leave it there. Mm -hmm. If it sits there for 30 years, you've got it, you know? Yeah, it's and, and it's the same with tile too, right? If you, Oh, yeah. If, you know, I had one where um, uh, we were actually – getting it together to sell and I had like maybe two tiles that were cracked on the floor and the rest of it was perfect. And, but it was like white, you know, six inch square tiles. I'm like, well, how hard could this be? <laughs> so I, the one that was broken, I, I chipped out as much as I could and took it down to, you know, big box stores. I'm looking, I'm like, uh. you know, it was either, it was either the, the tile they had was a different finish or different you wouldn't believe the different shades of white and i'm like what and i just couldn't find it and i ended up going to a specialty tile store and the guy went back to his you know warehouse and found like that exact tile and i was i mean i would have paid 50 dollars for that one piece of tile because i only needed like two of them mm -hmm. and i didn't want to rip up the whole floor and i didn't want to put a, a new tile in that was a different color because it'd be completely obvious so Definitely with tile, it's so cheap. Just buy an extra box and keep it. I mean, and they never go bad, you know. No, right, right. Well, you, yeah, you I don't know, know how hardwood. If you if you put that out in your garage or something, you have heat and humid. I, I don't know if that changes it or not, but yeah, I, I don't know. know. I we we my wife um they we we just built uh, well she opened a daycare about a year ago and we did a lot of renovations and it's in the basement of an old church which is now a photography studio. And we came across a box of old, beautiful cedar clapboard that had been sitting in an unheated area. It's still got the labels on it. I put it up overhead in my garage. I, I don't know what I'll ever do with it. Like, it's going to make a beautiful project for somebody someday. Yeah. But it's antique stuff, you know? And yeah. it's as good as the day it was built. Or or, or milled, I should say, you know? But yeah. wow, that's Do you ever awesome. deal with uh, staple up tiles? Or, you know, what they call like those uh, 12 by 12 or 12 by 24 tiles that just go on the ceiling? No, I haven't. Mm -mm. 
Well, my dad, um, they've had them in their house for years and he had a little water damage when I was working at the hardware store and he come down one day and he says, can you get me a couple of these tiles? And he brought one down and it turned out it was a 16 by 16 really? and they hadn't, they hadn't made them since the seventies. So probably asbestos, who knows? Anyway, he, and I, I said, dad, I can't get them. They haven't made them in 30 years. He says, you know what? Just hang on. So he went home that night up in the attic and he still had two boxes sitting up in the attic from when he did the work whatever it was 30 some years prior you know so <laughs> wow yeah yeah, acoustic exactly tile headsets, that. yeah. for sure but, that's such a good tip yeah it, it is just keep things set aside and you're talking about um uh pet pet mess and things like that but just mm -hmm. about a year ago i my, my um my march work last year was for a rental a young couple had lived in this house and they had two or three uh young dogs that they locked in one bedroom day mm -hmm. in and day out and completely destroyed the hardwood floor. Like, I mean, like beyond repair. And so the lady asked me, the owner, she said, can you go in and give me a price on repair and everything? And I said, yeah. So first thing we got to do is we got to strip all the hardware, uh, hardwood out in that room and strip out probably whatever soaked through into the subfloor and then start from scratch. And just before I started, she called me up and I try to keep an open mind. But, you know, when customers say, hey, I got a product I want you to try, you kind of roll your eye sometimes. Mm -hmm. She said, could you try this? And the product was called Decon 30. I bought it on Amazon and it's in a gallon and it, it smells like iodine. And they use it in hospitals. It's it's made from, of all things, uh, oil of thyme, you know, like the, the ingredient. The, and so... I did three sprays of that on the hardwood floor and I let it sit for two or three days each time and it eliminated any, it doesn't just eliminate smells, but it eats the bacteria as well. Oh wow! And so we were able to, of course we couldn't like, you couldn't re you, you couldn't leave the floor exposed because it was stained. Right. But mm -hmm. the smell and the bacteria was gone. So at that point we were able to just laminate floor over top of it and saved, probably saved her thousands of dollars. Oh yeah. But, you know, we still had, you know, still had to cover up beautiful hardwood floor, but it was better than tearing up hardwood and, um, the, uh, the underlay, you know? So when you put, when you put the laminate on top, did you, um, do you have to, um, cut the bottom of the doors off and stuff to allow for that extra gap? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, what I normally do around, uh, it depends. Like, in some rooms, I, I used my little oscillating tool and I kind of undercut all the moldings. Yeah. Oh, I was, yeah. Do you love them as much as I do? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. What do you, what's your best use for it? What do you use it for? That, that for sure. Cutting, you know, uh, molding and stuff at the bottom or cutting, you know, bottom of the doors. Um, you, you know, just getting into tight tight places to cut things if you got to notch out a two by four or something if it's mm -hmm. something down, oh they're great for for all of that do you ever use spray foam like uh you know the 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 and the um you know the expanding insulating foam. yeah i have yeah. i have some not not tons but yeah when i put when i install windows like you, you know you put them in and then you spray foam the gaps all the way around let it sit and of course i always spray the hell out of it way more than i should and so the next day you know it always looks like you know right and I used to, I had a hell of a time, even a really sharp, uh, utility knife is a bit of a pain in the ass to get it to trim and to get it to trim nice. You know, well, that oscillating tool zip in oh, 10 man. seconds. And if you've ever installed a window and you leave, you know, you put shims in there, the mm -hmm. wooden shims and you got to cut them off or break them off. Well, use your oscillating tool and you're done. I have, I've done that. I, I've kind of gone, you know, speaking of things like shims, I don't know. Do you normally use the wood ones or I've used the ones that are like black composite. Do you like that? I haven't tried them yet. I don't they're, know. If they're good. They, they, the way they're, the way they're set, they snap pretty nicely and clean. Okay. And supposedly, I don't know if they're more durable or not, but I, I like, I like using those now. Hmm. I will give them a shot. I love, I am a sucker. I, I do tool reviews too. So I'm a sucker for anything new. Uh, I just love to try it, but yeah. And if Ted, if you're still in here, uh, let me know if you've tried them too, because yeah, I, you know, um, so, uh, is there any, like, I know right now the market is pretty insane, but are there any like low cost? I know there's obviously no, no cost, but what, what would be like a low cost way to kind of enter the rental market or what would you think? Or is, is there even such mm -hmm. an option in this day and age? Um, 
I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of a lot of times they're asking for cash. I mean, if you get if you do financing in the states, normally they're gonna want to require at least twenty percent down. So, I mean, if you can if you can handle that, that's of course better than outlaying cash if you don't have it. But um, I don't know of one that's like low cash, no cash. Now, I mean, I guess you could do a land contract with somebody if they're if they want to sell. But um, yeah, I, I've not I've not done things like that, so I don't I don't know. Have you ever read uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad? With I, I I have, yeah. It's been okay. years, but I have, yeah. I read it last summer, and he, you know, he. I mean, sometimes you almost wonder how much of what he says is a hundred percent true and how much of it is, I'm not saying fabricated, but maybe misremembered with, you know, rose colored glasses of the past, you know, but, but he talked about basically buying things in auction or, or like foreclosure sales and things like that, but basically buying them on um, just with, with pennies on the dollar. I forget exactly how he explained it, but it was basically like a, he would, he would buy them cheap take out a loan for the 5% or 10%, whatever he needed for the, you know how most auctions are like, you, you got to pay 10% or 20% up front mm -hmm. and you got to come up with the next bit in the next 30 days or whatever. He would do that and then turn around and sell the property before he even had title on the property and uh, was able to, I mean, that's risky, risky business, but he had nothing to lose at the time. And it was, you know, obviously it worked out for him. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've heard of people doing that. I've not, I've not ventured into that because most of the stuff that, that I buy, I'm going to try to keep long-term, especially the cash flow. So like the ones that we have a, a, an opportunity on right now are pretty like they're, they're, they're low end. They need some work, you know, and I'm okay with that because I know a guy, you know, <laughs> we can mm -hmm. do some of that, but I, I don't know. I'm looking forward to like, actually the, the couple that I do where we've got, I think it's 11 anyway, it's around a dozen rentals we do. They bought, a bunch from a guy who basically just for years rented them as is where is you know like just the dirt cheap lowest rentals and so over the years i worked for this couple and as the previous tenants would move out we would renovate each one you know i okay. mean you know not like you know not taj mahal good but like really nice you know new middle of the road laminate or vinyl floor we'd paint you know put in new bathroom fixtures that kind of stuff and now um, every single rental has been redone, you know, only a couple need new furnaces. And we did this over, well, I, I worked for them for about three years. And before that they did it for about two or three years before that. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, now for, you know, most places were kind of in that, maybe I'm thinking around that $10,000 range to, to bring up, to look them really good, except for uh, actually the one we're in, we originally rented from them and then bought it from them, but that one ended up needing all new electrical. But other than that one, everything was, you know, in that five to ten thousand dollar range and then the rent was able to be quite a bit higher at that point right oh yeah sure yeah that's good so do you, what are your long-term plans for rental properties where do you i know i i know a lot of it depends on where the market is and i, I mean it, as long as i can find properties in decent areas that will cash flow i want to keep buying properties if i can sure. do you have a do you have an end goal in mind, like a number? How many you'd love to have sometime or? Um, no, I mean, probably, I mean, it'd be nice to have, say, maybe 10. Okay. Um, just as a nice round number, but mm -hmm. no, I don't have any specific, specific goals. Is know. that kind of your retirement plan too? Or what do you think eventually? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would... I would like to do that again because it's it's passive income and if, if if it'll support having a property manager take care of them then it really it really frees up your time you know so um it's nice when your money works for you eh yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah definitely definitely and so yeah it would be it'd be a nice retirement thing for sure it's good how far how many do you have a long-term goal how much you know how much longer till you want to retire you got a ways to go or what do you think i know we all we all think out loud you know but uh gosh i don't know i don't know if i'll ever retire i, I have too much fun but yeah I, I i love hearing that that's freaking awesome yeah because i know i'm the same way if, if you love what you do you don't necessarily have to retire you know you can just work on your own schedule a little bit more right 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 that's right 
That's right. Yeah. So if, if anybody has any more questions, throw them up here. Now we've been, man, we've been an hour and five minutes already. We've had a great, mm -hmm. see, you get, get on here, get talking. If you're like me and you like the sound of your own voice, it's not so hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So, and you're going to be at uh, LFTN spring workshop, are you? Yep. I'll be there for that. So that, that should be, that should be really good. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a nice event. Do you do karaoke? <laughs> silence everybody hear that silence yes uh, i haven't I, I they just always talk about it so it's very fun yes yeah. I, will, I will say that i'm not like super karaoke ish but on occasion if i get a few people to join me up there and i'm just kind of like one of the background singers i'm very I'm, I'm okay with that so um yeah it's 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 really and at the spring workshop it's just so uh, the people are great and by the time they get around a karaoke everybody pretty much knows each other there's no you know it's like no judgment zone kind of thing so it's really fun it, it's nice it's, sorry it's joe do you want to answer that one chris what is lftn i i i say it like everybody should know and, and there's a lot of people there's there, there isn't the overlap so sorry about that but so lftn is living free in tennessee and if you had nicole on she could tell you how it all started but it revolves around her podcast and the events that she puts on. Um, but people use use that acronym or those letters to describe it, but it's it's uh, Living Free in Tennessee. So you can do a search for that and you'll bring up her podcast or YouTube channel and, and all that. You want stuff. to know a funny story? I didn't listen to her podcast for a solid year because I thought it was for only people from Tennessee. <laughs> And I didn't join her group because I was like, oh, no, that must just be a Tennessee thing. And then I then I heard her complaining about it. She's like, I wonder if I should have changed my branding. I'm like, no, nah, I love it. It's a great name. And once you yeah. because once you realize it means she's the one living free in Tennessee, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, That's right. and and the thing is, you know, where where I live, um, you know, I'm a short distance away. But uh, as far as like growing zones, like zone six, zone seven, whatever. I'm in zone seven and, and, and I believe they are too. So, you know, just because you're not in Tennessee or two States over, you know, you can still relate when they're like, okay, well this week we're going to be putting out tomatoes because the last frost date was whatever. I'm like, Hey, that's the same as what I have. So, you know, you can definitely relate even if you don't live in Tennessee or live, you know, that was something I, I never thought a lot about, but when we first, have you seen the fireside freedom thing that we're doing at all yet? I don't know if you have. No. no, that's okay. So it's, it's about eight different uh, podcast creators. We get together and do like kind of a joint podcast once a week. And uh, I never thought about it, but when we first started getting together, I think it was about five or six of us that are kind of from the Midwest, you know, mm -hmm. and they were all saying like, this is great because we don't really have a lot of representation in the podcast world. You know, it's everybody's down like in the freedom end of things, you know, like our stuff, you know, Jack's in Texas and Nicole's in Tennessee, but we don't have anybody up in the frozen wasteland, you know? <laughs> and I get people a lot. Like I had somebody message me the other day that they're, they're like, I'm from upstate New York and I relate a lot to the cold stuff you talk about. And I'm like, Oh, that's cool. You know? That's right. That's right. For sure. So, yeah, I mean, everything that that's covered in the podcast or in the YouTube channel or whatever, I mean, you can relate to all of it. It might just be that you plant your tomatoes in May instead of April, you know, but other than that or, or late June here, you know, so. Oh God. See, Cause my last frost date is like average last frost date is like April 8th or something like that. It's about Which, where I, when I grew up in Nova Scotia, that's about what it was there too. Really? Okay. Yeah. I, we live right on the ocean and we were like a microclimate it, other than maybe really Southern Ontario and really Southern BC. It's the warmest area for growing in the country in, uh, in Canada. Like it was, yeah, it was really nice. But out here, like I said, minus 20 in April sometimes. Right. So usually not like we'll have warm days and normally the snow has started melting by then, you know, cause my snow contracts end at the end of March, but you never know what you're going to get. We have miserable weather here and then it gets nice. So how about your, um, I guess your first frost date, is that in October <laughs> then or something or, or even Earth? Oh no, no, you September 1st, uh, at, at, at the latest, sometimes into August, we have about really? three months, you know, that's really it. So, um, it's, uh, like, yeah, you, you, 
you can barely grow things like tomatoes and things like that. Like that's why this is a big crop area, you know, because things like wheat and canola and barley and all that, they're pretty hardy to um to uh cold temperatures, you know. Well, they you can start can around... winter wheat, right? So you can yeah. get a head start on that. Yeah. But it gets, you know, like I had it was a hundred. Oh, everybody's gonna correct me when I say this, but it was over 110 degrees Fahrenheit here this summer as well. So, you know, we we go from 110. And like, so it was 40, 43 degrees Celsius. So we go from 43 degrees Celsius to minus 40 Celsius between the winter and summer. So and that's it. It almost sounds like I had some friends that lived in Minnesota. <clears throat> it's kind of like that there where, you know, extremely cold winters. <clears throat> and then the, the two weeks of summer they had were like boiling hot. So, you know, it, it's amazing. We had about, yeah, we had about 10 days of the near 40 degree Celsius temperatures last summer but we have really nice summers they're just short you know three months you ever have people say gosh i hope your summer falls on a weekend this year <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what's cool though is we don't get a lot of rain and we get zero humidity up here okay. so like where i grew up in nova scotia the summers were longer but this we get way more sunny days out here like we um it, it's kind of the sunniest place in canada between saskatchewan and alberta and we just we you know this winter we've had a little bit of of cloud cover but for the most part we we get a lot of sun and it feels really good you know like mm. mine honestly minus 40 here normally minus 40 there's uh um it's usually sunny for the most part and very little wind most times like we rarely get a lot of wind when it gets really cold so yeah. you know now do you have i'm trying to maybe it's not your area but i always hear these horror stories about like it's black fly season or whatever that means or is We're that pretty like an Alaska thing or something? That, that's Alaska in Nova Scotia, inland Nova Scotia had it a lot where I grew up too. But yes, Chris, we don't, you know what? We it's pretty, pretty good place here. Like there's a few places in Alberta that have a lot of mosquitoes, but we don't have a ton of mosquitoes, barely any black flies. It's pretty good country to live in, you know. We don't even have any venomous snakes as long as you live above the Red Deer River. There oh, is right. there is rattlesnakes in, in Alberta, but they're below. And there's even cactus in Alberta, but they're like this big. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we do have, yeah, where I am, we do have a variety of creepy crawlies plus snakes. Um, it's too, guess, too uh, goddamn cold up here. It's, it's way yeah. too cold. Yeah. Cotton mouth. And um, gosh, I'm trying to think of what the other one is. Um, it's like a not a very long snake. It's real stubby. Um, but yeah, there are some poisonous snakes. And, and really... Uh, Gosh, probably more down towards the coast of South Carolina. You have um, rattlesnakes. Well, they, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be over the coast. Rattlesnakes yeah. get really big. I, I don't know the variety, but much bigger than the ones you'd have out west. Oh, so. sure. Yeah. I, I mean, and it's pretty rare. I don't know. Chris Dixon, he, he's south of my line. Uh, I wonder. I don't know if he would ever seen them or not, but he, he's a, a flatlander as well. So, okay. They, yeah. And, uh, Madison family, they say we relate to you too, Tim. We live 20 miles north of the border. What okay. province are you in? We'll have to, yeah, because it's, um, yeah, it's cool. I don't know. It's just, I love every time, I love getting people on and, and everybody who doesn't love talking about the weather, you know, it just gives us something to bitch about, <laughs> right? But, but you get a feel for where people live and what, what makes people go, you know. And I mm -hmm. always joke with Ted because he lives like, he's not far from Miami. So, of course, like, you know, cold weather is like 70 for him. And, and he, he jokes about the iguanas falling out of the trees, but apparently they really do when it gets cold. They they fall out and they, oh, yeah. they kind of they go into like a cat, cat, catatonic state, you know? Oh, definitely. But, yeah. Chris says they have rattlers 40 kilometers from here. So eh, 25 oh, wow. miles. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so um, do you like if, if anybody had any questions for you, do you mind if they emailed you or anything to ask or? Um. Sure, or, I can. Or do, you, or do you have social media, or what? What would be the way somebody could do a follow up question with you? Um, What's easiest them, for you? I guess have them go through you, and then just okay. just let me know. Sure, uh, I'll gladly. I don't really yeah. have like a social media site or anything like that. So no, that's okay. I okay. yeah, I appreciate it. I I know I, I like you come on literally with like ten minutes notice. So thank mm -hmm. you, I appreciate that. And, yeah. Um, anything else you wanted to share with like, see nothing really to plug or anything, but, uh, no, just, I, I think it was a good discussion about, you know, uh, rental real estate, if you will. And yeah, and that type of thing. So, but yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely worth something to consider. And I would say, you know, you talk about 
you know, when do you start doing this? Um, you know, if you, if you're a younger person that's just starting out and say, say you're renting a place right now, there's a lot of things you can learn from that. Look at your rental agreement that you have. Look at what the policies are for, um, you know, late payments, or if you're going to move out, you know, how many months notice do you have to give, you know, what the policy is on pets. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things you can learn about, you know, if you rent, a lot of times, and maybe you do this too, is when you're first going to move in, they'll, they'll do a walkthrough. And then you go through and say, oh, okay, I see that window screen has a little hole down in the corner or whatever. And you mark down all these little defects that you see. So when you move out, they can go back to that and say, oh, yeah, we're not going to charge you for that because that was already there when you moved in. Pay attention to how that stuff works because you're going to be in that situation where they move out and you're going to be like, what? You know, look at all this stuff and, um, you know, it'll give you an idea of, of the procedures that you need to go through with whoever you're renting to up front, you know, so you know on the back end how that works. So there, there's a ton of stuff you can learn, you know, from from renting a place yourself and, and decide like, all right, well, if I rent a place, I'm definitely not going to accept whatever. Type <laughs> sure. Of or whatever. You know, like some people don't like cats and things, but, you know. It, it, it helps you learn a lot about how all that works. So, um, you know, you can always learn along the way just doing stuff like that. So cool. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it, man. Sure. This was great. If you, you can hang around in the background for just a second, I'll close up and I'll be right back with you. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. No problem. All right. Guys, that was freaking incredible. That was an, that was an awesome episode. I, yeah, I'm very thankful for Chris coming in at last minute there. And he did a, a more than adequate job filling in. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. He brought a lot to the workshop community and I, I, I thanked him a hundred times, but I appreciate it. Um, it was, yeah, it was great. Hopefully it'll be an episode that a lot of people will want to go back to over time when they're interested in looking at property management, property rentals, that kind of stuff. And yeah, I just, I learned a lot. I think it's going to be good for us as well. So, um, where to find me next guys tomorrow night, Thursday, we got uh, the next episode of preparedness. That'll be, um, talking about dealing with frozen emergencies. You know, when winter fights back, we had a nasty ice storm here just recently. And it, I was just reminded of a few things and I thought we'd shake up the preparedness schedule. And instead of doing the exterior of homes, we're going to talk about surviving winter, winter issues and the whole works guys. So anyway, uh, yeah. Any of you are listening to this for the first time, just make sure you hit the you know, follow button on the podcatcher, uh, share it if you're interested, go by the YouTube channel, check out toolmantim.co. We got a whole bunch of stuff over there. Anyway, guys, that's it for me this week. As always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.